But for all of our ancestors who built the great civilizations of West Africa, for those who built Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Manamatapa, built the civilizations of Congo, who built the civilizations uh, in uh, East Africa, for all of those ancestors before this battle. I say, for all of our ancestors that resisted uh, foreign invasion, for, for like Asia New, Queen and Zinga, Yashantawa, for all of those ancestors before this battle. I say, for all of our ancestors who were captured and brought to these shores, for those who resisted during the Middle Passage, for those who resisted on the boat, for those who jumped overboard, for those who maintained their cool until they got here, for those who slowed their work down, for those who put something in the master's food, for those who ran away, for those who came to Dayton, Ohio, before this libation. For all our ancestors here in Dayton, that thought it proper to build a school here in Dayton for those first black teachers in Dayton, for Louise Troy, for Hallie Jew Brown, for Solomon Day, and all the other teachers and educators, known and unknown, in this city that have taught us and led us and guided us before this libation. For all our great ancestors, that we mentioned on these occasions for the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, whose birthday was on August the 17th, who said, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. For Malcolm X, for Martin Luther King, for all of our Dayton ancestors, uh, for James McGee, for C.J. McLean, for W.S. McIntosh, who walked these streets collecting names and dollars so that he could fight for civil rights for all of those ancestors, for our mothers and fathers, for John McClendon Sr. and all the, the McClendons who built this McClendon Center. We pour this libation and you should name your ancestors. We should name the Shaws. We should name the all of our ancestors. For Frank Crow. These barber shoppers down the street. Speak their name. Mm -hmm. All right. For all of those known and unknown, we pour this brother. For our children who will have who will have fuller and freer lives because we struggle and engage uh, society because we teach them and have days like this day to help them go back to school before this last night. Okay. you guys while we are getting ready for the ribbon cutting we have some very very important people in the place our commissioners are here and we want to hear from them while we're getting ready to cut the ribbon i'm gonna introduce y'all to commissioner chris shaw <laughs> Well, thank you so much and uh and greetings i really appreciate uh, the invitation i want to thank uh, Mama Renee and Mama Zippo and all of the, the board of directors for the McClendon Center, as well as all of our elders. We're just so thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, brought my couple of my colleagues with me, Jeff Mims and Matt Joseph, and uh, I am just so thankful to be able to celebrate this occasion uh, at the McClendon Center. Over the last several years, we've been doing a lot of work to restore it and strengthen it. And we're here. Look at this crowd. Uh, look at the work and the service that they have done over so many decades in our community. We have to keep them supported. We have to encourage them because they encourage and teach and help uh, build up our youth, which is so important for our community. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity as we kick off the great African American Cultural Festival in our city. Mr. Mims, come on, talk to me. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, we got to show you some love, too. We're going to give it over to Commissioner. 
And at first I was somewhat embarrassed by the fact that I had to sit in order to let me. And then I thought about it. And I remembered that when I was very young, it was very common for you to sit, to have their elders sit with them and gain knowledge and know-how from our elders. So I began to realize that I have made the transition from young to old, from junior to senior, and to elder. And so I got a note from my oldest grandson, and he wrote me this note, and he said, to my old man. <laughs> and I really appreciated that because in the African tradition, to be old is to achieve something beyond mere longevity. In Swahili, the word is unze, which is an honorary reflection on how one has reached the point, not only of longevity, but of wisdom. So today I wanted to speak with you shortly about the lessons of life and how they enhance learning. The lessons of life and how they enhance learning, thus forging the magnitude of academic excellence. Thus forging the magnitude of academic excellence. Now, what am I saying here? When I think about my father, I have to go back and understand that the lessons of life were the compelling factors for his role as a father, as a teacher, and as a leader in our community. There were certain lessons in life that he embraced and shared with us, not by merely teaching in the sense of talking to us, but inspiring us to search for knowledge. And that's important, you see, because in today's world, many people confuse information with knowledge. They confuse information with knowledge. They talk about this being the revolution in information or the information revolution. And so today, you have people who have the capability of utilizing social media and using the internet as a way of gaining information, but without knowledge. Now, knowledge is different than information. Think of it this way. If you have a puzzle, you have its many pieces. And we'll call those pieces information. But if those pieces are not placed properly together so that you can see the full picture, then you have a lot of pieces, but you don't have the full picture. So having a bunch of pieces does not make a puzzle until you learn how to put those pieces together what we said, the lessons of life are enhanced by learning. You have to learn that. And what my father did, he used to teach us in many different ways. I can remember when I, I learned my first so-called big word. Dad saw us one morning and he said to me, he said, son, what is on your agenda? I said, whoa, agenda, what, what does that word mean? And I said, what does that mean, Dad? And his response to me was, look it up. He didn't give me the definition. He said, look it up. Now, some of you may think that is an exercise of parental power. 
but it's not. It's not an exercise of parental power or parental authority. It's in fact delegating the power of learning to me to take the initiative to look up the word agenda. And in the search for knowledge, you have to go beyond just mere information. And so as we begin to search and search and search, it becomes research. And research involves gathering information and putting together the full picture coming up with the puzzle that tells us what the framework of life is all about. And that's why I say that the lessons of life are enhanced by learning. If you live a life and you don't learn from your mistakes, then that's when you're in trouble. Making mistakes is not the problem. It's not learning from them that is the problem. We have to presume as educators that everyone will make a mistake. Why? Because we begin in a state of ignorance. Now mind you, when I say ignorance, I'm not talking about stupidity. Ignorance and stupidity are not the same. Ignorance is merely not knowing. If you don't know, you're ignorant. And there's a lot of things that all of us don't know. And that requires our learning those things that we don't know. And so what my father did for us was to introduce this very significant factor of taking responsibility for knowing. Not saying, what did the teacher say today? Or what did someone preach to you today? But what did you think on your own today in order to arrive at knowledge? And so it, this brings me to a very old saying, a very uh, popular saying that Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, uh, would often say. And he would say, knowledge is proud that it knows so much, but wisdom is humble for it knows no more. And so, when we go from information to knowledge, we can't stop there and say, well, I'm knowledgeable. And my father used to talk to us about the meaning of knowledge and the meaning of intelligence. And he used to say, how does one measure intelligence? And I used to think about that. So how do you really measure intelligence? This is a matter of something called IQ, intelligence quotient. And we, when we look into the history of IQ testing, it tells us very little about intelligence. It tells us more about the person who is doing the work, Binet, than it does about intelligence. So we've come to understand that for many years, people were caught in the bind of thinking that IQ meant really being smart. So if you had a high IQ, you were smart. And so dad used to always say, how do you measure intelligence? And I began to think, when we begin to talk about measuring intelligence, we begin to understand that each and every one of us are both ignorant, that is lacking knowledge, and then profoundly knowledgeable of those things that we are very capable of. So we have to sit back many times and realize that it is not a matter of the formal credential, the degree that one has. And while I appreciate the very fine introduction that was given to me today, and yes, I do have those degrees, I want to say something that Dad taught us about the difference between certification and qualification. Certification and qualification. What does it mean to be certified? To be certified is to have a credential. High school diploma, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, MD, DD, and 
all kinds of degrees. But that's a formality. And why is that significant to say it's a formality? Because credentials are merely a form that says you have done certain things, but they do not confirm what in fact you know. That's why some of the most stupid people, notice I said stupid, not me, we're all ignorant. But stupidity is when you don't know and you fail to understand that fact. You don't know and you fail to understand the fact that you don't know. So I know a lot of PhDs who are very stupid people. They have all kinds of degrees. They've written stuff, most of it is uh, very inaccurate and very poor proof and has no real substantive uh, background. But yet, when you meet them, they belong to the and uh group. So they go by and uh, and uh, I would like to say and uh. I knew uh, uh, a Negro like that from Mississippi. And when he told me from Mississippi, I almost fell off my, my chair. He said, yes, I'm from Mississippi. And uh, the credential is only a matter of formality. The question is, what is the substance behind the form? What is the substance behind the form? If you don't understand that when you look at water, and when you look at steam, and when you look at ice, you're looking at the same substance, then you have to study a little bit about chemistry and understand that something called H2O assumes many forms. But the substance behind the form is H2O. Now some people will have the formal degree, and that's what Dad meant by having credentials called certification without qualification. And so we can't be knocked over, knocked out, pushed down over the fact that someone has an end up and a degree. In fact, we used to say in the old days, you may remember this, BS meant, MS meant more of it, and PhD meant holiday high and deep. <laughs> I think that's why I waited so long before I got mine. I have to admit, if I didn't get mine, dad was on my case for a number of years. I used to, the whole family would have to listen to at least an hour and a half lecture on why I had to go and get my PhD. He thought that I should have it, that I deserved it, that I should have it, and we used to go back and forth. So finally I went back and I got my degree. And he was so happy, it's one of the few times I've actually seen him cry. So that's how important it was to him. Not because I was certified, but he knew I was qualified, but because I wasn't certified, certain opportunities were denied me, not because of what I knew, but because of my credentials. And it hurt him tremendously to see that happen. And so I have to say to you, that this distinction between certification and qualification is something that struck home with me when my father taught me that. So you ask then, what is qualification? Qualification is when you have mastered knowledge to such a degree that not only do you know, but you know how to apply it in concrete situations. You see, a lot of people think because if you read a lot of books, then you're knowledgeable. Though the question, the real test is how can you apply what you know? What good is it to know physiology if you don't know how to apply it? What good is it to know something about mechanics if you don't know how to apply it? What good is to know history and you don't know how to apply it? And so what we find is that many intellectuals who have all kinds of credentials are unable to apply knowledge in a way that serves the interests of the masses of our people. And that's the real test. The test is not whether they have a degree, but how do they apply knowledge in the interests of the masses of our people? And if they fail to do that, 
we are capable of saying you are stupid because you do not know how to apply the principles of balance. And so you're just a little bit above those who are just what we call people who are gathering information. Let me conclude. When my father died, and Uncle Earl opened his mouth, the oldest of the surviving the Clinton siblings. This is my dad's brother. Could you raise your hand? Earl McClinton, 88 years old. And still going strong. What my dad said to me and what I'd like to conclude with is this. He was ill and he was concerned about many issues about how he was going to be treated in terms of his funeral services. And he asked me to give his eulogy. And he was concerned that someone may try to subvert that. And in fact, there was an attempt to subvert that. But I made a pledge to that that I would in fact do that. That I would in fact offer his eulogy. And you ask why. And I say why because I learned from him as a very young boy that you're never too old to learn. I watched my father graduate from high school. My sister Renee and I watched our father graduate from high school. How many of us could say we watched a parent graduate from high school? He went back to school, went to night school and got his diploma. And I can remember as if it was yesterday, his gown hanging in the dining room and going to his graduation. Then a few years later, he got a scholarship to Wilberforce University. It was a music scholarship. He had a wonderful baritone voice. He could sing tremendously, and he would give concerts uh, throughout the city of Columbus and the surrounding areas. And we used to go and hear him sing spirituals and work songs, and it was a, such a delight to hear Dad sing those songs. So my mother, wise as she is, said, <coughs> You have a month to get ready for a scholarship contest to Wilberforce University. It's a music contest for scholarship in music. Get ready. And so my dad entered into the contest, won a scholarship to Wilberforce University. And it was from the Wilberforce University experience that led our family to move from Columbus to Dayton, Ohio. And then once we got to Dayton, that started back in school, this time at Central State University. Of course, raising a family, working full time, meant that he couldn't take a lot of courses at one time. So it took him quite a while. And at one point, we had the unique experience of sitting in the same class together at Central State University. We both took Swahili together from Professor Siwo, who was from Kenya, and he taught in Wilberforce, but he also taught Swahili at Central State. And Dad and I used to joke about it afterwards because years later, when I went to get my transcript, I saw I had Dad's grade from Swahili and he had mine. So, I got his B plus and he got my A. <laughs> but the great thing I want to conclude with is that Dad, in seeing that he wanted me to give his eulogy, knew one thing. That I knew the measure of the man and the merit of his work. And the McClendon Institute for Learning is the measure and merit of his work. He recognized that the mug for his children, the most adept as an educator, is not me. 
It was Renee. Renee had the capacity to be a great teacher. And that's why he built the Clinton Institute, so that Mama Renee could exercise her talents. She had been teaching children in her own home. She used to have them in the kitchen where she had a piano and gave piano lessons and violin lessons and viola lessons and then history lessons and mathematics lessons. And so what my father saw and what started in 1983 was the vision for a future, the lessons of life enhance learning. And we have to understand that for Gene, that those lessons leads to an enduring legacy. And we want to thank you for sharing with us the legacy of John McClendon Jr. and the McClendon family and my sister, Mama Renee, who represents the pinnacle of excellence in education. Thank you. All right, people, let's get some energy up in here. This is a celebration. This is a Individuals who's got uh, various vocations, backgrounds, and careers. And we put that all together because what we want to do, we want to be an advisory council to all the various silos that are in our community that are basically doing the same thing. But we need to help them to understand the Africana culture. We have to implement that because we have to work towards getting our own. I mean, waiting on someone to give us something and to do something, 
uh, based on our, our bureaucratic system. You know, uh, that's a structure, but it is not designed to help African Americans per se. So I just want to say thank you all for coming out. It's a wonderful and beautiful turnout, and I am through. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Any other elders, we want to give you space. Come on, listen. Give up. I got up because I'm new to Dayton and um, I came here a year ago for two weeks to celebrate Black History Month and then COVID jumped off and everything was shut down and I was here with my fiance. Uh, oh. We don't want the mic to go out on that. Hello? Hello.
especially during the summertime when you have all these celebrations. The Makina Center is a very special place for me because I spend a lot of time in this building. Uh, doing rice of passage programs, uh, sitting on the board trying to keep this institution going. And so we can see that it has been revived. Uh, it's uplifting. And it tells me that the work we do oftentimes will not necessarily be seen immediately, but oftentimes it does not go in vain. Dayton is a very special place for me and my family because they have offered me the opportunity to grow and to develop. And now that I have retired from my career as a college professor at Sinclair, I now move on to Monrovia to new challenges. New challenges in Monrovia. We have some young people there who are traumatized by war. I was just telling one of my elders, we got young men who are living in the graveyards in the cemetery because of trauma. <coughs> and we will work on that and try to get them out of the cemetery. And back in school and black to be productive. So I thank you for the invitation to come here today and be with you and I'm real glad to see the McClendon Center revive and flourishing again. Dayton African American Cultural Festival. They have enough food to feed over 200 people. So what does that mean? We gotta make sure we get people out. So without further ado, I want to bring up the regional director, the boss man of PMC, amazing man that has, he is spearheading this sponsorship. And I, wanted, I want you guys to love on him and show him love because he is feeding he and PNC is feeding our people for this Dayton African American Culture Festival. So please put your hands together for Mr. Dave Mellon. Yeah. Well, I have to move up to that introduction. So uh, I am Dave Mellon, Regional President for, for PNC Bank here in, in Dayton, Ohio. I just want to welcome everyone to this kickoff uh, uh, party for the African American Cultural Festival. But before I get started, I want to say thank you. Um, uh, as, as diversity and inclusion has become, I think, more embedded in our community, it's made me a better person, it's made me a better leader, and it's made me a better husband and father. Even hey. tonight, saying, Ashe, as Commissioner Mims, I said, what does that mean? Help me understand what that means. And I think events like this is uh, what's going to make us stronger as we come together and learn from each other. Right. And I think if you think back, it's been 12 years from when this event kicked off, and it really invites the community to come together with different backgrounds and races and ages and experience Ameri uh, African American culture through arts and dance and song, and in many other ways. And uh, I think if you embrace that, uh, our community is stronger and our region is stronger. And I think uh, in our in our own organization we've really taken that to heart we look at each one of our members and we've got several folks from pnc here this evening and over the weekend and each one of them has a unique set of skills and ideas and experiences and if we leverage that we can make it better ideas come and we can serve our customers and invest in our, our communities even better and stronger and uh, oh hold on to that tent we don't want that to fall now <laughs> and, and I know I'm kind of between you and Pooh, uh, but I just want to say that I think uh, having a community like Dayton that brings people together 
having an African American cultural festival that brings people together in different experiences, makes our community stronger and leads our region forward. So thank you to the elders that have been the guiding posts and the leadership. I implore the young people to step up uh, and, and take leadership roles and take the baton and, and move it forward. Because if we don't do that, then we move backwards. And we're not moving backwards, we want to move forward. So I don't think any better way to stop there than say celebration, and let's kind of kick things off. And thank you for the opportunity to be here, break bread with all of you, and look forward to having some food and celebration. So I'll turn the back, microphone back over. Thank you. Thank you. See, PNC is such amazing, so amazing because not only are they feeding over 200 people at this wonderful event, guess what? They are providing security. So when you come out to this event, you can be assured that the street soldiers and so many others will be there to keep you safe because we protect one another. So thank you, PNC, for today, Mellon, and team. So thank you so much for all of y'all. We want to get, we want to definitely support our businesses because we can love on each other, we can hype up each other, all of them, but we must support each other with our dollars. We need to circulate the dollars. So we definitely want to give honor and respect to our business. So we're going to do this e dating style. Okay, okay. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for attention to this program. My name is Tawana Hogan. I'm the CEO and founder of House of Restoration. Thank you.